welcome once again to EW10's Bookmark. I'm Doug Keck, your host. Our special guest author is Jason M. Craig, author of Leaving Boyhood Behind, Reclaiming Catholic Brotherhood, published by OSV, available through our EWTN Religious Catalog. Jason, uh, nice to meet you, nice to meet you here on, uh, on Bookmark. People remember you were on with Life on the Rock. Also, you were featured in a five-part miniseries we did right, called Rites of Passage. Is that correct? That's right, yeah. Okay, so Leaving Boyhood Behind, Reclaiming Catholic Brotherhood. So, Jason Craig, what makes you an expert on this particular topic for you to write a book about that? I don't see any, any uh, MD or PhD behind there, so... They just couldn't fit it on there. Okay. And, uh, um, no, because I need to leave my boyhood behind. Uh, but I've been involved for, really since my own conversion, in sort of the man problem, the man crisis, what's going on with men, both the fathers that are either absent or not forming their family and their children in the mm -hmm. faith, or boys and teenagers that um, you think, what in the world are they thinking? What's wrong with them? Uh, I've been involved with, you know, writing and speaking, but mostly as through Fraternus, which is an apostolate that the idea is to train the men in a parish to mm -hmm. be the mentors to the next generation, which doesn't sound very controversial or innovative or anything, but most people will nod if I say, every boy needs to have a mentor. They will say yes. They need to have Catholic mentors. If they're going to be good Catholic men, they'll say yes. And then if you ask the question, so when does that happen at your parish? Nobody has an answer. Right. Um, so we culturally don't have the means uh, to mentor boys anymore. Those, those have broken down in a variety of ways. Have you also found out, uh, and, and I can imagine in reading through this book that you could get some pushback from some people who seem like they're, you're saying, well, you're devaluing the relationship with the mother. What about the single mother situation? You know, I mean, yeah, who says a man has to teach a young boy? I mean, we've had a lot of problems with men and boys over the years. Yeah, I mean, the problems are men and boys. When you hear there's been a school shooting, do you ever think, I wonder who the girl was, mm -hmm. you know? Uh, when you hear these acts of violence, for example, is an overwhelmingly male problem. It's not a societal problem or both genders. But, uh, but is that a learned behavior? Um, yes. Well, it's a fact of insecurity. And if you want to ask, if the people who might give me that kind of pushback about, well, single mothers, they're doing the best they can. And, uh, but one of the most common phone calls that we get in fraternities is from single, from single mothers. mothers. They are the ones that recognize, I have given my son everything I can give. But right. you know what I can't give him? Masculinity. I right. can't give it to them. I don't have it to give. Right. So they're the ones that are clamoring for the church, for mentoring groups for men to show up and mentor their boys. And then we've got I, w w the, the crowd you would just describe telling them they don't have to do that, mm -hmm. which is, th that's coming from the mouth of, of a bureaucrat and a self-proclaimed expert. It's not coming from on the ground need, right. which is every boy has to have. If, if you're a faithful Catholic man, if anyone watching this is a faithful Catholic man or they know, you can ask them every single time, tell me about the men in your life that helped bring you to where you are today. They always have an answer. Mm -hmm. And if you ask somebody who's fallen away from the church, how often is it that the, the father or no men, literally no men were involved in making sure he didn't fall away. So as a boy enters into his manhood, if he looks around the church and he sees women and children, mm -hmm. He's going to go, well, um, this is a place for women and children. If I want to be a man, I need to go somewhere else. Right, which is what you talk about in the book. Right. Now, you got Anthony Eslin, who's an interesting thinker, uh, who's been here many times. Finally, a book on the Christian faith and the crisis of manhood in our time by someone who remembers that we have bodies, that a boy's body is not like a girl's body, that boys are supposed to become men. And he says manhood is something men have to win. What do you think he meant? Yeah, there's always been a sense that to achieve manhood is actually something that you have to do, and that is not an information that you memorize and regurgitate, that there's something that we have, like he said, we have a body. This experience within our body, within our soul, within our mind, all of these things are bringing us towards maturity, and it, what's, what's occurring, and from the title of the book is what I'm trying to say, is mm -hmm. you're leaving behind boyhood. You know, St. Paul says, stop thinking like children. Right. You know, I want you to stop reasoning like children. I want you to, I wish you could eat the meat of truth, but you're still drinking milk. You know, there's a sense of to grow up to salvation. And we as Catholics, we know that that's not just data. So this is not, we can't put boys in a room mm -hmm. and give them the information of being a man. You said, I know my father worked me hard to make me a man. He gave me hard work as a gift. Then you go on to say masculinity, despite his assertions to the contrary, is not something you can build by sheer effort. It's a gift received and responded to. What do you mean by masculinity and how is it a gift? 
Well, when you, when you, you brought up violent men earlier, right? So a man grows into his strength. You know, even at, when, when uh, St. Luke ends the narrative of, of uh, St. John the Baptist and our Lord, he says they grew into their strength, right? When a boy is growing to that strength, he wants to know how to use it. And, if, and he's seeing himself change. And he's never been a man before. That's an important thing. He's been a boy his entire life, and there's a way to be a boy, and he's never been a man before. And it is a gift that's passed on. This is the very idea of tradition, of patrimony. I mean, we call it the church fathers, the gift that they gave us, the, the apostolic fatherhood of the church is passing something on to us that's a treasure. And if you don't receive that gift and you go try to achieve it on your own, you end up becoming either, a, you know, there's people who have described it as a wimp or a barbarian or mm -hmm. a brute or, or a brat because the man who's constantly trying to overpower all the men around him it's ultimately insecure. He hasn't been given the gift of masculinity, secured so it. So there's a difference between machismo and masculinity. Absolutely. Yeah, well, that's the, that's a false masculinity. And, and the machismo attitude is primarily in societies that have a breakdown of fatherhood, mm -hmm. right? Because there's a strength, and even the gang mentality, there's a strength that comes with being a man. A, a man. And if you're not taught how to use that strength, you know, if you're a wrecking ball aimed at the wrong thing, mm -hmm. wrecking the wrong building, that strength becomes dangerous. On the other side of it, though, if you sense within you, I have a strength, I have a calling as a man, and you don't have someone confirm, you know, confirm that or affirm it and teach you how to use it, you can become passive. You can become right. totally, you, you, you don't have a leadership role in your family. You feel like everyone around you doesn't respect you. So it's kind of the opposite of the man who's trying to control everybody is he just feels controlled So by what does watery concrete have to do with all this? <laughs> well, so my father is not a theologian, not a philosopher. He's a blue collar working man, which I'm very proud of. And uh, when you are working with concrete, it can be very difficult because uh, it's gravel, sand, water, and cement, you know, and you're trying to move it. Uh, and it's literally turning into stone mm -hmm. as you're working it. And one of the ways you can make it easier to work with is add water to it mm -hmm. uh, to make it easier on you uh, working it. The problem is when you add too much water to it, it becomes weaker. Mm -hmm. So I think that's a really good image of there's ways we can make life easier for young men, but in the long run, if they don't learn how to move that gravel and sand and cement around, you add water you early on. You see, pouring weaker. concrete with them starkly contrasts to the worlds of home and school, places run by the motherly figures of my life. In this tough environment, uh, there was simply no room for whining and self-focus. Now, are you saying only only men can pour concrete? Uh, yeah. No. <laughs> I mean, of course, you can have women out there, but there's. The great thing, and Anthony Essen brings this up a lot, is that there's nothing like physical labor that actually does bring out the difference mm -hmm. in the sexes. That there is a difference, that men have a form of strength that does, yes, they are better. Sure, there can be women that grow into physical strength. We're seeing strength. that in some of the transgender competition. Right, right. It's, speak, it's, right. It's, it's an absurdity to take a man's physical strength and have him compete against women. It's, it's an absurdity. Uh, and the fact of the matter is that in the blue collar world, mm -hmm. the real world, um, there's not uh, there's not people clam. There's not women clamoring to get on the concrete crew, because it becomes manifestly obvious that we didn't get the job done today because we didn't have enough manly strength on the job, mm -hmm. right? And that, that's not a um, ideological. That's facing reality. Mm -hmm. So w what I'm describing there is when I would go to work with men. So when I'm a boy mm -hmm. and I'm in school, which is overwhelmingly a female environment, which right, you talk about and have some yeah. statistics on, right? Yeah, it's uh, w both in CCD classes in the church in general, but also in society and school teachers and all that. That boys live in a highly uh, right. and it wasn't always that way. I mean, even I'm old enough to remember even in grammar school having male teachers in still in around the third, fourth, fifth grade. That's right. Yeah. Today, most of the te there's there's a lot of male teachers. There's uh, in math, and then a lot of coaches are still men. But in general, uh, the difference and, and a lot of they might have had school teachers, but the the primary place that boys encountered men in our culture and society is work, mm -hmm. physical labor. But in a highly industrialized technological society, we don't have these means. That's why I call it, it was a gift mm -hmm. to be able to work, to be in an environment where, as Esalen said, where I have a body and a right. mind and a soul, and all of the men around me treated me completely different uh, than in when I was in school or when I was in the care of you know, the mothers. Right. You they, say there's a time when I, I was leaving boyhood behind, and you talk about adolescence as the transitional phase between boyhood and manhood and my impression is you think that adolescence goes on way too long yeah. in our culture today. Yeah, some people say we've invented adolescence that mm -hmm. traditional societies they ended boyhood as soon as possible because the the sooner a boy 
learns what his strength is for. Like, hey, look, I'm gaining some muscle. Great, here's a shovel. Uh, is good for him because he immediately can apply his strength, apply his, his intelligence to a project before him. When we extend adolescence and we keep extending it, I mean, right now on into college, it's these, these and that's on our farm where we do retreats and things, there's a lot of college students that come and they've just been living in an extended adolescence. Mm -hmm. And what they need is the experience in their body, in their mind, in their soul of leaving back, the, right. leaving behind the comforts of childhood. So when we prolong adolescence, what we're really do doing is delaying growing up. Right. Too many video games? Absolutely. <laughs> I mean, that. I, it, what's funny, I've, I um, have been in rooms where, with boys and you can say all sorts of controversial things about human sexuality, about you need to give up this, you need to stop looking at that. But if you say, also, you need to stop playing video games, it's like right. you ask them to sacrifice. That's their, the third rail. Yeah. It's just... <laughs> I, and I can't believe the attachment. And today, and I, I, I hope some of them are mm -hmm. not playing video games, maybe they're watching this now. The fathers that have young children and, and they're married, telling me why it's okay for them to play hours of video games um, a day, mm -hmm. in a day, right. um, is an, is, that's also an absurdity. They should know on an intuitive level that from their experience, from the gift of masculinity, that it is not okay to play a game instead of attending to your duties as a father. You don't need to you don't need a rest time. That's not even restful. You don't. I mean, you're playing a game. Well, it's escape. Yeah, absolutely. In, in exactly what yeah. it is. It's, Into it's, something they began as a child. Right. And they never put it away. Right. That's a good point. Well, I can say I remember years ago playing one particular game and playing it for like two or three hours and realizing, this is addictive. I can't do this, and I just <laughs> never did it again. What game was that? It was uh, it was called Desert Strike. This is many <laughs> years ago. Nintendo. Yeah, I, whichever one of the games <laughs> it was. But it was just the kind of thing I realized if I'm going to get anything done in my life, I, I, I there's no way because it's it's great. Right. It's fun and and and, it, and now there's a know. difference today. I think if you look at the games people are playing, right. is their first person adventure, yeah. heroic yeah, RPO battles. Or yeah. yeah. And um, what's interesting is that they're they're. I think what video games are giving actually is a lot of what we're not giving. So they're simulating the experiences of the mind and the body that a man right. wants to have. And a lot of times they they also have these role playing games where you're you're in teams. Yeah. And you're working with other people, so you're getting this virtual team building situation yeah. that that used to happen more in the local neighborhood. Yeah, as you're getting now, I think it's all simulated, mm -hmm. but you're getting brotherhood, you're getting adventure, you're getting a role to play, you're getting mm -hmm. purpose. And whereas they get outside of the video games, and what they have a, a world of relativism, of nihilism, where nothing matters. I have no purpose. I'm just a cosmic accident. Right. They get inside this world. I've got brotherhood. I've got meaning. I've got a mission. I've got a purpose. Right. I've got a uniform. I've got a gun. I've got you know. Right. I mean, you can see why it's attractive, but. It's still a game, right. and the, but it's part of the problem of uh, You say, today I speak to, write for, and work directly with men who want to feel within themselves a masculinity that is alive and real, but who are clearly uninitiated. How does one get initiated? Well, that's the rest of the book mm -hmm. um, that we think of. You know, the book is based around um, what we know as rites of passage. And when we hear that word, we often think of going out and killing lions. We think of... Um, the big sensational things that might be on TV, but really it's a it's an anthropological understanding of how a society helps an individual leave behind one state of life mm -hmm. in order to to embrace a new state of life. So the the rest of the book is that initiation is not if people are looking for a quick fix, right. it's, it's not there. Um, I can tell you the stages that have to happen, and if it and it sounds I'm I'm not presenting myself as an expert. This is an observation of human right. nature, and I think every time people hear it, they say. You're right, that needs to happen. And then the follow-up question, so when does this happen? Uh, but a society that has a rite of passage, so most of us know marriage, mm -hmm. right? You cannot be a married man and a single man at the same time, right? Those two and forms- And that's one of, of the areas you point out is why there's a delay, because people are delaying getting married, right? Right, yeah, because well, the, the, marriage is obviously a major step in growing up, becoming a man, um, of, of having the responsibility. But they, re I, re I think, boys need to become men mm -hmm. before they're married so that we as men culturally we need to prepare the men to say yes you're prepared for marriage i mean just think of a man the, the custom of a man going to uh, his soon-to-be bride's father and he says i would like in a sense the father is affirming yes you're man enough mm -hmm. to have my daughter i mean there's a affirmation there of him not just a permission as if she's a a, a passive ornament for mm -hmm. that being passed between males it's really about them mm -hmm. saying or do you have what it takes to enter into this? But for marriage, is a, marriage is a rite of passage because you're leaving behind being single 
and you're becoming married. You're becoming one flesh. Yeah, you're right. being incorporated into a body. So that's right. I mean, funerals are a rite of passage. The sacraments, the sacraments of initiation. Mm -hmm. You know, that's the word initiation. Is that's the first three sacraments that, that you have to have first the death of the old self in baptism, the the confirming of the new identity in mm -hmm. Christ and the anointing of the Holy Spirit and confirmation, and then the incorporation into the body through receiving the Holy Eucharist. And you say that the poor presentation of men in popular culture, and you got Homer Simpson mentioned here, is not so much about presenting men as buffoons and idiots, which they do obviously on a regular basis on television, but you say, but about presenting them as self-centered and immature. Yeah, I think. Instead of just saying they're bad men or they're idiotic men, I think the better way to say is that they're immature. They're, they're boys in men's bodies. That the Homer Simpsons and the, the, the cliche images of the, the, you know, the buffoon on television, what he actually is is a boy in a man's body. That's a better way to understand it than I wouldn't say he's even a distortion of, man, of manhood. He's, he's not a man. Mm -hmm. We have uh, enough cultural, from just observation, also from philosophy and then also from revelation. We have images of what it means to be a man. It's not, you say, oh, that, what a broad thing to define. And, mm -hmm. and um, in a certain way, yeah, I'm not gonna give the world over universals, mm -hmm. but the, the, every culture, every healthy human culture recognizes within their place, um, within their people, what it looks like to be a man. But the universal aspects of that are to be pulled out of mm -hmm. selfishness and narcissism right. into giving yourself in a community, being a part of a brotherhood, uh, using your strength sacrificially. I mean, these things we know and how they take shape are different. But these buffoons on, on TV, they're just, they've never done that. They're passive and they're, they're often very wimpy. They, mm -hmm. They're not leaders. Um, I mean, the other extreme on television is just the, uh, the jerk, mm -hmm. the dominating, overpowering, cliche jerk. I think that's where the, the toxic masculinity comes, comes from. from yeah. right, that, that straw man that's put it. You say Catholic men are not exempt from this crisis of mature manhood. In working with men and boys since my conversion to Christ as a teenager, I have trouble, I'm troubled at how little Catholic literature there is on masculine maturity and mentoring, universal practice of male rites of passage. How does one become a mentor? Are, are, is each father a mentor for his own child? Yeah. Well, mentoring is not a, a necessarily a Christian word. I mean, mm -hmm. it comes from the Odyssey. Mentor is the man that Odysseus left Telemachus in, right. in, in charge of. And you of. talk about that. Yeah, yeah right. so yeah. Uh, when I say mentoring. And that was his son, so. Yeah, that's right. It's a helpful, it's a helpful uh, analogy for us though, because when we hear the word mentoring, we think of doing something like right. if you're or like an apprenticeship where you're, mm -hmm. you're learning how to act how to the mannerisms you know blessed John Henry Newman talks about in um, the idea of a university that you have to be around someone for quite a while to learn all the nuances of things that we call character to mm -hmm. learn character so every boy needs those right. but they're isolated heavily there, there's a, a a generational isolation we've got the men over here and we've got the boys over here and in the church the big problem I see is that we uh, affirm and confirm and perpetuate this isolation. So we've got our men's group over here, we got our young adult group over here, we got our youth group over here. Mm -hmm. And the very fact that we have youth groups, middle school and high school, isolated from men in mm -hmm. a co-ed environment, oftentimes the youth group is a co-ed environment, without mentoring mm -hmm. from men and being in a brotherly environment, which and is- And most of those run by women? Absolutely, yeah, okay. overwhelmingly women. There are some men that are in it, but I, I not to be controversial, but what I've found mm -hmm. is that a lot of the boys or the young men that are running youth groups are running it because they actually don't want to grow up. Mm -hmm. So they're trying to appeal to youth as youth. Mm -hmm. You know, we always say, oh, the young can reach the young, which is just not true. I mean, yes, of course we need, in between the older generations and the younger, we need these bridges, mm -hmm. but ultimately, no, we're, bringing, we're not bringing them into, we, we think about it as you're going from the youth group and then to the young adult group and then to the slightly older young adult group. It's like, no, no, they need to be, brought into a brotherhood of men mm. as soon as possible. Mm. So the fact that we've isolated, even in the most successful men's groups and youth things in the church, we've isolated men from boys, shows that we don't understand masculinity very well in, in, in the way that we do apostolate. Mm -hmm. And we tend to think in the church, well, we've got this down because we've got an all-male priesthood, right? So we've, um, we understand this stuff. So right. we don't, I think that's part of the reluctance to talk about it. It's like, mm. why are you talking about this men's stuff? You already got it all male Episcopate right. and all this stuff. Like you want more, can we talk about? It's already male dominated. Well, yeah, it's already male dominated, you're, which you're, is. You're insecure that's with right. what's going on in you the just want, church these days. Yeah, that's you're the a patriarchal problem, idiot. Right, yeah. and you're just trying to recapture the past. You say, the book's not primarily about the distinction between man and woman, but boy and man. And he's, what exactly is given up when a boy becomes a man? 
that's a question you ask. Yeah, I think obviously within different cultures, within mm -hmm. that's going to look different. But we, you've brought up one that you're recognizing, which is uh, the ways of a boy when it comes to maybe they're playing video games, yeah. right? So this is something, if you're not, uh, and we were discussing before the show, when someone, what is it that makes a conversion, you know, within maybe the evangelical ward or somebody that becomes a Catholic who's a convert, what makes them so zealous mm -hmm. for their new identity? And it's the fact that there was something that they left behind. There was mm -hmm. something that they had to put away to embrace the new identity. And the reality is boyhood is so distinct from manhood that they, they can't be lived at the same time. Mm -hmm. You can't do that. You say at best our modern society is delaying maturity for men and at worst we're punishing it. And, and that's something, talk about that because uh, where you know the natural uh, rambunctiousness as you talk about in the book of a, of a young boy right. in, in many ways is seen as a negative thing today. Right, yeah, they um, are literally medicating but you know the budding masculinity out of boys uh, they're a boy who is wildly passive who does exactly what he's told who conforms to his environment who never causes trouble who's never loud is the best student in the class mm -hmm. right which is as I'm describing that I think men listening would go you can't describe that then as an adult man and say he's passive doesn't assert himself keeps his head down mm -hmm. does what he's supposed to do and doesn't cause any trouble Moms out there listening, they're not thinking, yeah, that's the kind of man I want around. They, they don't want that. But yet, we're, so we're punishing it as boys enter into this because they're, I mean, they're under, they're inside in an air-conditioned environment under artificial lighting with artificial scents, with artificial screens everywhere educating them. They're not experiencing the reality that's required to grow up, to mm -hmm. become a man. So this is, this is a massive problem. And then when they start to I want to get up out of my, I want to use my strength. So think about what, what I was describing, the gift my father gave me of, right. there's so many boys out there that are in trouble. I mean, right down the road from me, I live in a rural community and there's this after school program for the troubled boys. Mm -hmm. And they literally, I, I pass by, I go into this classroom and they are, they, they're given medicine and they're pacified on screens and they're overseen by women with clipboards mm -hmm. watching them. And I think, man, I wish I could go to the farm because I have a little farm. I wish they could come with me and I guarantee you, you gave them a, a, a meaningful job to do, some work, some craft, something to be proud of with mm -hmm. their hands instead of keep, because what they're doing is keeping them idle and pacified. Right, right exactly. Um, so they're punishing. These boys are probably in trouble. I mean, they probably are fatherless. I, I'm guessing that because I see them dropped off by mom, picked up by mom, overseen by a, a, a mom, a maternal figure, and the right. teacher. Um, if they had a man right, who said, may be doing the best they can. They but, are. Right. They are, but what they, they can't give masculinity. Right. So if they had someone in their life that could give them the gift of hard right. work, it'd be totally different. And what is a rite of passage? Because there's so much in this book and we're not going to get through. People are going to have to pick up the book to, to get all of it. But you say women also go through rites of passage to womanhood, but these rites are deeply rooted in their physical and psychological makeup. In other words, they're, they're naturally occurring and naturally powerful. You talk about, obviously, when a woman goes through and when she has a child, et cetera, and that those things don't naturally happen to a guy. Right, right. So obviously there are natural things that happen in a woman's body that orient her every month towards the reality of their, the, the possibility of, of being a mother, right? Within a boy, he doesn't have such an experience, which is why in a lot of um, tribal societies, things like circumcision were delayed until adolescence. And the idea was, you know, do you see what the girls have to go through? You're going to go through something too. Mm -hmm. And th those things were also oriented towards showing them that they're a father. Because birth itself is a rite of passage for a woman, not for the man. And the, the man has to be brought through the initiation by the men who said, this is what it means to be a man. And then they send them, in a sense, to their family to love. Right. You connect in Jesus' rite of passage. You talk about the story of a, the child Jesus in the temple. And it's not so much about his childhood, but about the transition out of childhood and the mission that will eventually be associated with manhood. You see that connection. Absolutely, yeah. When I was studying the rites of passage, and I was thinking, wh when it happened, when it occurred, I thought, wow, well, I want to see this in Revelation. I want to see this confirmed, because Jesus was a male. And that, that has meaning. That has a purpose in God's design. Uh, so he would have been through this. And St. Luke is very clear uh, in what we call the, the finding in the temple, the losing right. in the temple. He literally is saying this was the moment that Jesus in his humanity was oriented towards the mission of the Father, away from being a boy. So are, are you recommending throwing kids overboard? <laughs> overboard what? Depends on <laughs> well, what. Well, in Captain's Courageous, you, right. you talk about the Kipling story. Right. So. Okay, so that's a good, 
segue to what are the parts of a rite of passage and why is Captain Courageous by Kipling, that's a rite of passage story. You know, all great hero epics that involve a boy and, and, and even the hero's journey are in a sense, they're, right. they're rites of passage. So the parts that have to occur for a man to leave boyhood behind is first he has to leave behind his boyhood. And that means leaving behind the world of women, mm -hmm. right? So we say, we have this phrase, you know, women and children first, men stay behind. You know, there's a distinction mm -hmm. there. Women and children are united in sort of an image of a, of a, of a pregnant hope of humanity within okay. them, right? So, a, but a boy, when we say women and children, we don't say women, boys, and girls. We say women and children. So a rite of passage separates the mm -hmm. boys out and says, okay, you're something different from the women and children. So the first phase, they have to leave that behind. So the problem is if, they're, if they don't leave that, they continue to act like a boy because the mothers continue to treat them like boys. Not, they're not doing anything wrong. It's right. what they do. They are mothers. Well, and you talk about the hormone and the connection, that a DNA connection that a, yeah. a mother will always see her child, then there's a unique relationship there. A mother can't. Right. She has a very difficult time she knows and loves and cherishes her son. In fact, some of the golden years, they say, are from like nine to 11, where a mother has a special bond. And then that bond is so strong, it has to be severed. Mm -hmm. We see problems in marriages when it's not severed, when the mother and the son have an unhealthy relationship that, in a sense, is competitive with the new wife. Um, he has to have a way, and this doesn't mean rejecting her. Jesus goes back home to live with Mary, but something is different, something has changed. So the second stage is that he's initiated by the right. men. That's the experience in his body. The last stage is the hardest thing. In right. fact, this is the part where people, well, I got to the end of the book and I almost lost some hope because you have to join into a meaningful right. living brotherhood. Well, you've certainly raised a lot of questions here with this book and it's certainly worth taking a look at. Leaving Boyhood Behinds the Title, Reclaiming Catholic Brotherhood. Jason, Craig, thank you so much right, for your fine work and thanks for being on Life on a Rock and that wonderful mini-series you did with uh, Peter Gagnon and his team and the whole guys at Fraternus. A lot of guys here involved in that. It seems like it's wonderful work, so keep it up. Thank you. And don't forget, you can get this through the EW10 Religious Catalog, EW10RC.com, Leaving Boyhood Behind. Check it out. Check us out next time right here on Bookmark. Thanks.